All right, so let's just quickly continue our discussion of uh, models. Uh, we'll just do a little bit of testing and then we'll uh, hopefully move on to the next part. Okay, now uh, here, this is the NPV model. So I just want to test, Jen, what is the endogenous variable in this? Have you seen this NPV model before? You have? Okay, so what is the endogenous variable in this NPV model? One minute, I'm asking Jay. I'm asking who is the size. What? Font size. Let's see if we can make this. It goes out of uh, view. Okay, so you're saying font size, adjusting font size is a better way to do it. Okay, if I just make. No, sorry, it's 14, right? So let's make it 18. So this this model, this link is already there in your. No, this will also not work. So we have this mo first module in your notes. Okay, guys, be, squ be quiet. Be quiet here. Okay, so we have this first module in your notes. Okay, you should start doing the readings in this sequence. All right, this is your first module in the notes. And then here we have a discussion at some point. We have a discussion of models. So this, I put the hyperlink in here. You can click this link. At this stage, we went into the discussion on models. When you click this link, this file will open up. This file is also in your folder, okay? So you can have a look at this. And then we are discussing this now. Where are we in the NPV model? Is this clearer now? Yes. Actually, this font, the, the font color here is a little light because I just copied it from somewhere because I didn't want to have to write it because we want to make sure that everything is on the uh, on the screen rather than me doing it on the board. Then it doesn't get captured in the video. Right, so Jayant, you're familiar. Can you read this now? Yes. Can you read all this stuff? The NPV model you're familiar with? Okay. So uh, tell me now, we're just doing some quick revision from last from the last class. Okay. Uh, Nikhil, why don't you sit here? That'll be good. I don't think Gaba's coming. Come and sit next to uh, Sonam. Okay. All right. So uh, what was I saying? Okay. The NPV model, you've already done this before in your FM1, FM2 project NPV analysis, right? Now, what is the uh, endogenous variable in the uh, NPV model? Only Jayant. Be quiet. Everybody else be quiet. Quickly. Remember we discussed endogenous, exogenous, etc. In, uh, in the last class? So I'm just testing now. I'm just doing some refresher testing. Yes? Any answer? What is the endogenous variable in the NPV model? No, no, I'm not asking you to define the endogenous variable. Now I'm asking you point out to me this where model has very many variables in it. Yes. Now I'm asking you to point out to me which the endogenous variable is. Sir, NPV. NPV. Okay. What about you, Gunjan? What is your view? You don't have a view. Sir, I was not there last week. You were not there last week. So what is your responsibility when you miss the class? You should have revised the class. Okay. Nikhil, what is the endogenous variable in the NPV model? Is Jayat correct? Yes, sir. He's correct. NPV is the endogenous variable. Okay. Who, uh, Nikita, what is your view? My qu you remember the question? Yes or no? Yes. So, is Jayat correct or no? I can't hear you. Sorry, give her the mic. Uh, yeah, her voice is very soft. Yeah. So, according to you, the discount rate is the endogenous variable. Okay. So now Sandhya has a problem. She has to decide whether Nikita is right or Jayant is right. Yes, tell us. You heard her answer. According to her, the endogenous variable in this NPV model is the discount rate. According to Jayant and Nikhil, it's the NPV. Now, whose side are you on? You are with Jayant. Okay. What about you, Hemani? Yes, 
NPB is the endogenous variable? Okay, what about your Kaneka? NPV? Okay, good. That's not a very strong, I mean, you're just very weak uh, response. Okay, all right. Okay, guys. So, Jayant and all are right. Jayant and company are correct. Yes? No, no, no. Now you have created more confusion. Okay. In most of these models which you are using, will have typically only one endogenous variable most of the models okay theoretically when we define the model that's why we put output and bracket s outputs because theoretically when we define models we should be able to capture all types of models and many models will have multiple outputs okay so that's why we define a model generally but most of the models that we are dealing with you have only one output okay so in this case the endogenous variable is npv okay what was the other one you said discount rate if it is not given, sir. Oh, it will be given better. <laughs> no, it's not given. You still have to use the uh, input. Uh, you have to still calc. You have to still estimate the discount rate. When you do a typical project NPV analysis, what is it? When you are doing, when you are uh, analyzing when the project is funded by both debt and equity, what is the discount rate that you use? The WAC, okay. So when the project is funded by both, you use WAC. Otherwise, you use cost of equity when it is purely funded by equity. Okay. So now, uh, so therefore, you still have to estimate those numbers. And there, again, there there is subjectivity. Remember what we discussed in response to Goyle's question that he was surprised that it was all subjective. Remember when we were discussing models, valuation models, and M and A. So he was a little surprised that everything is subject. It's all subjective. <coughs> But be very clear that this is all subjective. Okay, so if I give you the same project case study, and then uh, Aryan will have a different cost of capital, and you will have a different cost of capital, quite likely. Okay, based on the assumptions you make. Okay, so therefore, uh, based on it will have differ even based on things like what period, because even the beta calculation that you do for your cost of equity, if you estimate the beta over six months of data. You'll get one beta if you use the same uh, date, the same uh, equity, same stock. But if you just ch change your uh, period from six months to say two years, your beta will number will most likely be different. Okay, if it's the same, it's just a coincidence. Most of the time, be different. So there are lots of reasons for differences to arise, even in the cost of capital. That's a discount rate. Okay, so all of these will come. But the point is, when you are looking at the model per se, the model per se. They, I think why you got confused is that these things also have to be estimated, okay? But these are not endogenous variables in the language of models, yes. okay? Because when it comes to the model per se, you will estimate all that stuff. You will estimate your cost of capital. You will most important estimate that you're doing here is the C1s, yes. the CIs, okay? This is the most important estimate that you're doing. So in most of these kinds of fair value models that you're going to do, you have to remember that the biggest source of error is the CIs. Okay. Normally, there wouldn't be a huge amount of variation if you look at different analyst estimates. There wouldn't be a huge amount of variation in the cost of uh, in the discount rate. Okay. There will be variation, but the variation will not be wide. Okay. But if, if you look at different cost, uh, analysts and their estimates of the CIs, it will differ widely. That's why I keep coming back to the example of Tesla. You'll see that if you look at the market for Tesla, the analysts, there is a whole, uh, there is a very wide dispersion of views. Okay. Because of the industry that is in. And all that so uh, so that's that's very natural that's what happens in the real world and that proves to you once again that this is all subjective okay everybody has the same basic information everyone knows how many cars the competitors are making how many because all the other competitors competitors are also moving into electric cars they everybody knows Tesla's production numbers everything is the information is the same for everyone but using the same information in the background the same FA information that uh, everyone has people come out with different estimates for the CIs okay so that you have to understand as part of the whole modeling process because you may be doing a lot of this in your work although I personally think it's the utility of these things actually is very highly is uh, overestimated okay people don't that's why you'll notice that one thing you'll notice when you have asked you to follow people like Jeffrey Gunlack, Warren Buffett then Howard Marks all these people right and uh, even I mentioned uh, I also mentioned about uh, Lloyd Blankfein once where he uh, was asked about predictions and he said I, I don't focus so much on predictions but I just focus I don't spend so much energy on predictions but I spend more energy on the risk management when the prediction goes wrong okay so one of the things you'll notice is that people who actually have to manage money 
okay like Howard Marks and all these people they don't focus too much on these they don't spend in fact Warren Buffett doesn't do any you'll never see him doing all this modeling he just does some back of the envelope calculations and he uh, decides to invest you billions of dollars right so uh, and recently he's invested in an Indian company which Indian company was that Paytm, Paytm I think right so he invested in Paytm as well he wouldn't have done all these he would have just looked at the overall business strategy and they focus more on the people he would have focused more on the people he would just meet the the managers and then take a decision based on his gut feel okay right so uh, so what I was saying is that this discussion is important because it is important for you to understand that the CIs are the biggest source of error in the models okay I had mentioned to you earlier about the TXU situation which was a 47 billion dollar uh, LB leverage buyout okay which went for a toss eventually the company had to declare bankruptcy that is essentially because they uh, whatever they had forecast for the CIs that stuff went horribly wrong okay because natural gas prices collapsed and those CI estimates eventually they just became a joke so the company didn't earn anything and they eventually had to declare bankruptcy that was a 47 billion dollar so I think it's very important to have uh, this little part of our discussion where we talk about the fallibility of these models okay and so if you take that example of TXU okay and the people who invested who who decided to invest in TXU were very well known names in the industry like KKR okay not your your version of KKR but Colbrook Cravis Roberts okay which by that time had already I think changed their name to KKR but Colbrook Cravis Cravis Roberts is the preeminent LBO firm this is the firm that essentially brought LBOs to the limelight okay so um, uh, if you see that film uh, Barbarians at the Gate that is based on the uh, Colbert Cravis Roberts takeover of RGR Nabisco okay so these are the guys so these are the 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 gods of LBO of the LBO process Goldman Sachs was one of the investors in TXU okay so all these big name investors and they're all messed up big time okay why did this happen because it's a fact of life no matter who you are even Warren Buffett has made a big mistake now which is the company that he invested in has recently yes yes Kraft Heinz very good at least some people are keeping up with what's going on dollars. yes Four billion dollars, the valuation was down by four billion. I think it was more than that I think it was from 11 or 16 or something like that they had to write down they had to write down a lot of their yes. uh, goodwill yes. okay so this is the reason this was a problem and the SEC is also investigating them for this and other ac accounting thing so the stock has uh, collapsed dramatically yes, sir. okay so actually Warren Buffett uh, just being interviewed you can check that interview actually CNBC just interviewed a pretty big interview and uh, he is actually admitting in that interview that uh, he overpaid for Kraft Heinz okay so you can see how fallible so it's very important because from all the other courses that you will do when you go outside you'll find that every Tom Dick and Harry is peddling courses on modeling okay and that's because people have a fetish for all these things okay so they're ca catering to that fetish and these people will never tell you about where the risks are because if they tell you that these things are very fallible if they tell you that the real investors like War Howard Marks Warren Buffett those who actually have to manage money in markets these guys don't rely too much on these models okay then what will happen is that will reduce the importance of models perceived importance so then they can't sell their courses you understand that I think you should also understand the politics of all this and the marketing aspects of all this okay so the guys who are teaching you or giving you all those courses they are never going to tell you about the pitfalls of these things okay so it's important to be aware of these pitfalls so don't fall in love with these things these are just you should know what you need to know as an MBA student is you need to know the theory behind it you need to know how it is constructed you need to be able to know how to do it using your office productivity software like spreadsheets and stuff you should know how to do these things but in your mind you should have a deep skepticism about these things okay you should be aware of all the case studies of how these things have failed Buffett Kraft Heinz is a big example he's saying I we actually overpaid by almost a hundred billion according to one of his uh, you know fr uh, frameworks where he's talking about how much capital they're actually employing how much tangible capital they're employing in the business okay and he's saying we paid overpaid by almost a hundred billion dollars okay for the craft piece of it the Heinz was already there from before uh, but the craft piece of it they overpaid so you can see somebody like Warren Buffett with so many years of experience and such a smart guy okay and he's even he's made a mistake because uh, it's not that he's it doesn't make him a fool okay it doesn't mean that KKR and Goldman Sachs were fools for investing in TSU it just means that it's just an affirmation of the fact that life is very uncertain so is and so is business life so is the economy and so are asset prices so you need to have a healthy respect for this uncertainty 
So don't think that you can really predict anything. That's why people who actually manage money, who actually have to run risk books, like people like Gold, uh, Goldman Sachs' Lloyd Blankfein, who comes from a trading background. That's why when he was asked, he said, what did he say? He said, I don't spend too much money on the prediction. I spend too much, I, mean, I spend much more time on the risk management. How am I going to manage the risk if things go, uh, don't go my way? Okay, so the real people will, uh, the, the real money managers will always give you this kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, bias towards, uh, you know, more of a gut feel uh, and, and more of a focus on, uh, on risk management. Okay, never mind. So we have this. So the important thing to understand most of the time, this is the riskiest part of the, uh, of the whole ball game, the CIs, okay, the forecast of the CIs. And these are, this is what makes uh, the whole thing subjective. Remember, these are all subjective. Okay, these are fair value models. These are all subjective. Okay, so we've done this now. Let's just quickly. Um, I want to just discuss something else. Okay, I will add. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do later on, you'll find I'm going to just paste it into your. Um, all right, okay, I'm going to just paste it this part. Okay, I'll do it after the class. So I have written a big, uh, I mean, reasonably. Uh, there should be more material. Yeah, there is some data here. So it's a big segment actually uh, on stationarity. Have you heard these terms? Stationarity, non-stationarity of time series data. You haven't heard these terms? Okay. So these are slightly advanced concepts in, in modeling, which essentially deal with the topic of what makes the models uh, uh, fail. What one of the things that makes models fail? Okay. So these are the, the these are so, so there's some material that I put here. What I'm going to do is non-stationarity, things like non-stationarity, robust estimators. When you did statistics, did you do robust estimators? R-O-B-U-S-T. You haven't done that? Okay. So essentially a robust estimator is one that is not going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, will remain accurate even though the underlying assumptions of the model change. Okay. So these things are important concepts. So what I'm going to do is this entire block, you'll see that it will be pasted in your note here. Okay. This particular note here that you have, this V1 predictive models, I will paste this, okay, from my version into your version, but I will leave it as out of the syllabus because these are actually quite complex topics, okay. Uh, but I want you to read for your own benefit as a finance student. It will be kept out of the syllabus, but you should read it on your own, okay, and uh, try to develop at least some feel for these ideas. At least be aware of these terms, okay. Things like non stationarity, which is nothing but it it just talks about the instability of the time series okay so essentially time series data in finance and economics okay uh, like you look at the euro dollar fx rate over here essentially what we are saying is that this time series is unstable okay it, it, i'm giving you a layman's version of non-stationarity okay what i mean is just that the time series. you see how the nature of the time series is changing visually also you can see there's a type of movement here on the left panel but after this point the nature of the movement has changed can you see that yes. up to here like if we make this a little bit more uh, if i make this four hours you can see other kinds of changes in the distribution okay so essentially uh, you it's imp it's a, it's good to have a, a a layman's understanding a loose understanding of uh, a non-mathematical understanding of instable uh, of uh, non-stationarity all right. Now you see there are many. See here that there was a different type of distribution. The price was moving in a particular way. Okay. Then you can see here also there are some changes. All right. And then. Okay. So when you look at any time series, any kind of time series data, you will see features like this. Can you see here? There's a lot of up and down movement. There's a lot of volatility. But here in this period, the volatility tends to collapse a little bit. Can you see that visually? Okay, so when you look at a time series data chart, you look at look out for these kinds of things where you can visually detect that uh, the nature of the distribution is changing. Okay, so this is what loosely non stationarity refers to. Okay, so these are the things that I'll be uh, these are uh, these have been discussed over here in this note, and I will put it into your uh, uh, into your note. It'll be kept outside the syllabus, but I think it's a very important thing to be aware of. So for your own good, you should read it. Okay, and the last conclusion that I will tell you, which uh, which you should uh, again, which I will actually tell you, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but the net effect of all this is, this is something you should remember because when you go into the industry, people will come and very often present you with models. Okay, they'll come and say, oh, I've got this is very common because there's a big business in selling all these kinds of 
new models and things like that you can see with many people selling uh, modeling courses and stuff like that so now uh, people will come and sell you to more and more complicated models okay and they'll try to show you that the forecast accuracy is very high you're familiar with r square and all that Yes. Okay, so they will try to show you there's a very high R square. Okay, it is able to explain most of the data. Okay, but you have to be aware of one simple rule I'm telling you. Uh, I'm just going to give you a simple rule, which is this here. Okay, in general, you should always trust very crude and simple models. Okay, don't get seduced by over complicated, over sophisticated models. Okay, because this will have a, this, these things when you read the whole segment, you'll see, you'll understand why. But I'm giving you a thumb rule as a general rule, always distrust models that are too complex, too many explanatory variables. Now you know what explanatory variables are. Okay, if you keep on adding explanatory variables, you can improve the R square. Okay, but that is a that is not a very smart thing to do. Because eventually you have to use it on real life data in the future out of sample testing okay so as a general rule remember this that crude and simple models are much better than more sophisticated models with too many explanatory variables don't trust those types of models because typically when people come and try to sell you models they'll try to sell you models which look very complex because human beings have a fetish for complexity if i show you something which is very lots of equations looks very complex okay people will be very impressed even though actually it may be all garbage in terms of content but people get impressed when they see all these equations and wow, looks very complex, must be good. Okay, this is a human fallacy that we ha all have, most of us. So you have to guard against this. Okay, and so, so I just wanted to have this discussion. And later on you read it, it will be kept out of the syllabus and uh, uh, you, but you should still read it for your own good. Okay, so we've done this part now and uh, what we will do now is, okay, let me just go into... Is your calc file open? Yeah, okay, your calc file is open. So now I'll just continue. We are just going to uh, spend, uh, yeah. All right. Now, guys, now let's just go. We'll just continue our model, uh, um, our model module, okay? modeling module uh, let's go back to some basic remember we did a discussion we, we we enumerated all the we listed out all the decision problems that exist in managing an investment portfolio right okay now can you uh, can you tell me when you have when we have all this discussion on modeling and things like that all these npv and all these things which you are doing uh, what decision problem remember typically what happens in most uh, in most of the uh, finance courses is that uh, things like valuation, you know, Damodaran has a book on valuation and all that. So there's a lot of discussion on valuation in most finance textbooks. But typically valuation tends to fall from the sky. Suddenly you have valuation. Okay. Now if I connect you back to the decision problems, the listing of decision problems, we have a bunch of decision problems here. Let's just do it here. I'll wipe it out later. Okay. Uh, we have, what are the decision problems in managing an uh, uh, investment fund? Which asset class to invest in? And which instrument? Okay. Which asset class? Which market? Okay. What instrument? Okay. Or uh, buy or sell? Entry. Entry. Exit. Exit will have two parts. Profit or loss. Profit or loss. Okay. And have we missed in one decision problem? Units, 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 units. Number of units. Position size is also a decision problem. Okay. So amount. Let's call it. Let's call it amount. Okay. So these are just uh, loosely listed over here. Now tell me, because remember the whole uh, the structure of the entire uh, set of electives is is all anchored in decision problems. We are not interested in things which are not going to help us to solve decision problems, right? Because the decision problems are all that matter. So now when I when 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 I uh, when you want to teach me valuation now I ask you now what is why do I need valuation which decision problem does it help me with okay you can always ask this fundamental question why do I need to learn about asset valuation models okay which decision problem does it help me with is my question clear buy and sell who's saying that Shivani okay anybody has a different view Kola no you agree with her okay yes Sandhya you agree so it is always buy and sell okay so you should also have this connection in your mind that this whole valuation discussion because most of finance theory is kind of focused on the valuation discussion 
different aspects of it how to calculate cost of equity how to calculate cost of debt this that okay how to calculate WAC should we use the same WAC for all the periods all that stuff so it's all focused on valuation uh, most of finance theory but so what you have to understand is that valuation is really relevant in the in the context of the buy sell discussion okay the decision problem relating to whether I should buy the base asset in a particular market having chosen the market instrument combination now do I buy or do I sell okay that's the decision problem in the context of which valuation arises now what is very important to understand this is again in your folder you don't need to copy any of this okay so now I had uh, can I just delete the first row yeah we get more of a view all right okay so now this uh, pay attention to this framework again this is important for from a perspective point of view okay uh, we won't have time to go into every aspect of this but this whole discussion is happening in the context of option models okay so remember now this valuation thing is this in the is relevant in the context of the buy sell decision problem right now what you have to understand is now typically when you have the discussion of valuation in the finance textbooks uh, you are not really given an uh, uh, sort of you would typically end up with an impression that the valuation aspect is important for all all uh, for uh, whenever you have to solve the buy sell decision problem you need to go into the valuation aspect are you following what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Typically, when the valuation discussion happens in finance textbook, uh, it's not explicitly discussed, but the impression you would get is that uh, whenever you have to solve a buy sell decision problem, you need to go through the valuation exercise. Are you following? Yes, yes. Okay, you agree with that assessment? Okay, but this is not actually correct. Okay, what you have to be aware of as finance students is that there are two broad approaches to solving this buy sell decision problem. It's a very important decision problem. Okay, although not the most important, uh, but this is uh, what most uh, finance theory focuses on the buy sell decision problem. So, what you have to be aware of, let's look at this first uh, distinction. Okay. There are two broad philosophical approaches to solving the buy sell decision problem okay one is what we will call let's look at this first one category is value agnostic you know what agnostic is agnostic is someone who does not know okay or is not really interested doesn't really care okay so typically when we talk about religious people we contrast them with one category who, which is an atheist an atheist is it's not these are not well defined terms but I'm defining them precisely an atheist you should define as someone who is convinced that there is no God okay a religious person okay like a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew a is con convinced that there is a God and the God is Jesus Christ or Allah or whatever okay uh, now uh, as that's a religious person then you have an atheist atheist should be defined as a person who is convinced that there is no God okay and then the third category is the agnostic who is not really sure I mean he's not decided either way he, he's kind of not really sure doesn't really care okay indifferent he's kind of indifferent okay so that way this way you get to define uh, you get to define a distinction between atheist and agnostic okay atheist is sure that there's no God so this guy is absolutely sure that he's not sure he's not sure either way sure. okay he's unsure indifferent indifferent doesn't care uh, okay doesn't have a view okay so what we are saying is that there are two broad approaches to solving the buy sell decision problem philosophically one is what we call a value agnostic approach value agnostic means I'm not interested in what value is I don't really care value, I don't care about what the value is okay so in general whenever we are saying value here in this context we are talking about fair value okay we'll have further discussion on fair value but essentially value is fair value so this value agnostic approach we don't care what the value is that's that's the essence of this approach okay and this is where you have this is where ta falls in okay so ta is pure price based analysis remember there's a distinction between price and value yes, yes? people are looking blank yes, which is vibhu <laughs> which is subjective and which is objective between price and value one minute I'm asking her between you understand these two terms price and value which is subjective and which is objective good so value is subjective 
and price is objective always remember this okay because we are not using we are using these terms very carefully so when we say value we are typically referring to something valuation is there's only one exception to that term which we will see later but uh, other than that gen whenever you use valuation models these are all subjective okay and uh, price is objective price is what you observe in the market so it's objective okay so price is objective value is subjective okay so in ta as we have already discussed you guys are already familiar with ta ta what do we do we don't really care let me see if i have one of these things okay all right so i we don't really care in fact i can just do this here i have this euro uh, chart as well i can just take a view here if i'm doing ta okay now here we have the euro usd spot fx exchange rate okay so it's an important question which way is this going to go should i buy or should i sell okay and so obviously forecasting is related to the buy sell decision if my forecast is bearish then i will sell if my forecast is bullish i will buy okay here which is the base asset in this market the euro euro is the base asset and no us dollar is the term asset us as dollar is the terms asset is this clear okay so now i need to take a view on this market i need to decide whether to buy or sell now if i do this now remember there are two ways to do this one is a value agnostic yeah. approach and the other one is the price versus value which we haven't come to yet so the value agnostic approach approach is essentially what ta is okay purely price based agnostic about value i don't care what value is okay I don't care what the fair value of the euro is. Okay, so what will I do? I will look at this and I'll say maybe there is a downtrend here. Looks like there's a downtrend here. I see a series of lower lows, lower highs. Okay, and this most important lower uh, lowest high here has not been broken to the top side. Okay, and then they came down, made another lower low, and looks like overall it's bearish. Okay, so I look at a trend analysis. There are many more sophisticated ways to do TA. TA is a subject by itself. You can actually do three courses on TA itself. So it's a huge body of material, but I'm just giving you a crude version of TA. Okay, when I look at the trend, it's like I'm surfing waves and I look at the trend. It seems to me like that there's a downward trend over here. <coughs> That's a reasonable assessment, you think? That's a reasonable assessment. You could look at this and form a view that if I'm, especially if I'm a momentum player, Okay, if I'm a momentum player, that's a reasonable assessment for me to make. Okay, so then what I do is I just go, I'll assume that the other decision problems are solved. In this case, I just decide to sell it. Okay, and I can sell it at market, etc. and all that. I can still decide number of units. So basically, I've solved my buy-sell problem. Is this clear? I've solved my buy-sell problem. I did not, did I refer to value at all? No. Okay, so this is the first thing you have to understand to have a comprehensive understanding of uh, different techniques in finance okay and how they connect to the decision problems so it is not correct uh, to imply that for every time uh, for every solution to the buy sell problem you need to do a valuation you don't need to do valuation if you only believe in ta if you don't believe in fa and the other approach if you are philosophically committed to the ta approach okay then you are able to do solve the buy sell problem without any reference to valuation this is an important thing to understand is this clear to everyone yes. be clear about this that you can solve the buy sell problem without any reference to valuation if you buy into the ta religion okay we can call ta religion it's a belief system okay you believe that this is all that matters value is not important okay and you practice ta so is this clear first thing okay now so this is what is meant by value agnostic i just look at price trends i could do all kinds of other stuff like i could just come up with an indicator okay uh, you can maybe we should spend uh, should we spend time on i think you understand ta now i don't think we need to spend time on indicators okay there are other things you can do like following um, i'll just briefly show you other approaches that are possible so here's spy okay let's take two uh, of these and where are the indicators here let's take a moving average we haven't ex have i explained moving average no okay it's just an average of uh, the prices okay in particular so now you see i did a 50 day moving average can you see it here can you see it so another type of ta approach would be again to say that okay now the price has risen over the 50 day moving average so i'm going to buy it okay now all you need to know at this stage about the 50 day moving average is that it you it takes 50 days of data at a time okay 
and keeps on shifting forward so today it will take the last 50 days yesterday it took the last 51 days okay leaving out obviously uh, yesterday's price so that's how the chin keeps shifting the 50 day moving average just the average of the prices so here again am i referring to value no reference to value i just look at the market price i do some manipulations of the market price these are manipulations of a moving average is the manipulation of the market price okay in mathematical language we say manipulation i've manipulated the market price by taking an average a simple average okay so once again you see i solve the buy sell problem price went over the moving average so i buy price goes below the moving average i sell i've solved my buy sell problem okay without any reference to value this is clear to everyone okay so you should be aware of this okay we maybe spend a little bit more time on this topic uh, on this point but it's important that we hammer it in okay now come back to the framework so now you understand what ta is so there are all these kinds of subcategories within ta okay you can see momentum mean reversion which you have already discussed okay so this is the whole subject by itself which we don't have time to go into right now at this point i'm just highlighting this point now contrast ta with what i call the value versus price comparison based analysis okay so in the other approach one approach is to completely forget about value be agnostic about value just look at price and do the job with ta the other approach is a com based on a comparison between price and value okay this is the other approach to solving the buy sell problem so this is what i'm calling the value versus price comparison based analysis so in all these techniques uh, you are essentially what you are doing is the framework you are using is you are comparing value to price okay and so typically the the way you use this framework is value versus price comparison based means that if you find that price is below value what will you do will you buy or sell if price is below value you will compute a, in, in the way this framework works is the way this this family of approaches will work is you will first calculate the value because you don't have to calculate the price the price is visible to you in the market you can see the price it's objective okay you do need to calculate the value is this clear you need to calculate a value you calculate a fair value the way the framework works is like this okay which is uh, maybe we should put some of this here okay let's put uh, I'm not writing perfect English here, solving buy sell, buy sell DP. Okay, DP is decision problem. Okay, now what we say is C uh, sheet. What do we so that you, those who are sleeping right now can uh, figure things out when they read the notes? See the sheet DP4 paradigms in. What is the name of the file? This is, uh, this is called spoon feeding. Okay. C sheet DP4 paradigms in this file. Tree. Okay. And if you want me to spoon feed more, I can hyperlink the file. <laughs> but I think you can find the file. Okay. All right. Now we are all these uh, further discussions are with reference to the sheet and the framework in the sheet. Okay. So now we are discussing value versus price. All right, so uh, let's just copy this. Okay, how does this framework work? Now, how how does this work? Um, calculate fair value. Okay, calculate fair value. You know one way of calculating fair value. You've already done this before for project analysis when you go here what is this which part is this npv model of a project okay uh, of a project's returns okay now here which is the fair value part here is my question clear guy guy has an enigmatic smile on his face why question is not clear okay very good good one minute one minute i'm asking guy in this npv model you understand what fair value is now I think you have some idea about value or fair value okay so in this npv model that you see which is the fair value part this is the npv model of a project okay now just explain to me point out the terms term one term two term three uh 
which is the fair value part. Is my question clear now? Yes. In the NPV model, okay, notice what I've done here. Why are we discussing NPV now? Quiet, guys. I want everybody to pay attention here, okay? This is very important stuff, and you'll not find this in any book. It's important for you to have the perspective, okay? One sec. Please focus here, okay? Now, in this model, why are we discussing NPV? Remember this projects, okay? So, all right, because what have I done? I've classified under value versus price models, okay? I have put in many kinds of models. I have uh, put in also, I put in project NPV, okay? So I'm actually saying that this project NPV business is uh, under this family. It falls under this family of approaches. It is a value versus price based, uh, a comparison based analysis. And that's the way you solve the buy sell decision problem, okay? So what I'm trying to show you now, what I'm asking, is this context clear? Okay, now in this context, I'm asking you when we go to the NPV model, you already have some idea about value and price. Okay, now I'm asking you in this NPV model of a project cash flows, which part represents the fair value of the project? Is my question clear now? Yes. Okay, yes, now Guy will answer. Give him the mic. No, you answer with the mic. Yes. Cash flows. Cash flows of different uh, years. Cash flows of different years. Actually, well, you, uh, okay. You can say you should say periods, but different years. Fine. That's not wrong. Okay. So you're saying that these cash flows. Uh, actually, what you should say is the because I asked you for the terms. I asked you for the terms in this equation. So you should say one minute. One minute. Strict. I know what you meant, but what you should have said is the pvs of the cash flows because you the entire term is here so it's not just the cash flow it's the pv of the cash flow to be very specific are you following why i'm criticizing your answer okay what you should have said is the pvs of the cash flows right so now do you agree Tushar? yes sir. you agree yes sir. so if you add up the pv so on the rhs of this equation if you leave out the c0 if you leave out the c0 which is the cost of the project okay the rest of it is the fair value of the project? So, but shouldn't it be compared with the outflows, the inflows? Uh, inflows should be compared with the, with the outflows. No, no, we'll come to that later. One minute. I'm not saying that you should not be compared. I am just now at this point, I'm only focused on this question of in this NPV model, in this representation, which part represents the fair value of the project? which is in the uh, on the RHS but leaving out the C0. C0. Why is it? Be, I'm coming to that. What is my question? My question I my question is not what is the NPV of the project? Watch my question. My question is not what is the NPV of the project? If the question was what is the NPV? Then if you say RHS, then it's okay. Then the answer is correct. But my question is what is the fair value of the project? The NPV is not the same as the fair value of the project because the NPV has a word net in it okay so be clear about this also that the NPV is not the same thing as the fair value of the project is this clear Sandha are you following okay all right so uh, now is this clear that the fair value of the pro is everyone should be clear at, up to this point because I don't think there's agreement on this yes Sushant what does your notebook say <laughs> what are you studying? Fortnite. <laughs> no, what is the point of using I what is the point of my giving you guys the notes? The whole point of it is that you don't have to take notes in class. Okay, one minute. Uh, all right, okay, guys. So please be clear about this one point. I think even this was not clear to everybody. Be careful about how the language is used. My question was not the what is the NPV of the project. If that was the question, the answer would be the RHS. Okay, here this is clear. My question is what is the fair value of the project? To that, the answer is not the entire RHS. It is the RHS, but leaving out the C zero. Leaving out the C zero. Is this clear? But it should be compared for. I'm coming to that. 
I'm not dis I'm not disagreeing with you on that, but you follow my line of questioning at this point of time, okay? Uh, so, uh, so now is this clear? This is the fair value of the project, okay? So if you look at the NPV equation, it has two parts. On the RHS, there are two parts. There is the cost of the project and there is the fair value of the project, okay? You're comparing the cost of the fair project with the fair value of the project, okay? So uh, let's look at, uh, let's take the example of value versus, uh, so we'll, we'll, I'll write this later on. So this is the fair value. Now, is it also fair to say that uh, the cost of the project is equivalent to the market price of the project? Yes. Sir. Would you agree with my statement? Yes, sir. yes, Nikita, you agree with my statement yes. that the cost of the project is equal to the market price of the project? Rahul, you agree? Yes. Anybody has a problem? I mean, I don't want to say this in a threatening way, <laughs> but <laughs> is everyone agreed? Kriti? Are you in agreement with my use of the language that the cost of the project which you are familiar with the C0 I am now giving it a different label I am calling it the market price of the project. Is current market price? Yes, current market price of the project. Do you have a problem with that change of label? Ankur, you are okay? Okay. Now why did I make this change of label? Sir, because now I am going to put it, yes, yes, double A, yes. Sir, I am not able to say yeah, 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 please use the mic. Yeah, you should. And anytime you have any kind of doubt, even a comma, full stop, you don't understand if you ask a question. Yes. Sir, I don't really get uh, what do you mean by market price of the project. Like, sir, every, uh, every company, when they, uh, when they uh, do estimates of cost, they are different. So, how can we take one single market price for the cost? Okay, good. Very good question. Okay. But effectively, what we are saying is when you finally, typically, how does a project work? Let's say Delhi Metro wants to extend the line to Karnal. Okay. They'll ask for, they will put out an invitation to tender. Yes, Remember the case you did in your contracts? Yes. Sir. Union of India versus Madala Chataya. Yes. The uh, tendering case. Yes. Sir. Okay. So uh, now what will happen? The, the Delhi Metro will put out a tender, invitation to tender. Yes, in response to that, various engineering companies will submit their tenders. Yes, okay. Now one of the tenders will be accepted. Okay. So let's say that LNT's tender is accepted. And let's say they have quoted, uh, say, $20 million to complete that line. Okay. So they'll do an end-to-end -end, uh, uh, project. So they will just complete the line and deliver it to Delhi Metro. Okay. So now effectively, because they have accepted the LNT bid, presumably it was the lowest cost with quality constraints and all that. So because they've accepted the LNT uh, project and they took a very, uh, to, to, they took multiple prices from multiple vendors. So it's effectively like you going into the market and checking various market prices. Okay. And if the market is not so well organized, that is always only one price. Okay. And then eventually you found the best price. So now it's effectively like a market price. It's the cost of the project, but essentially they have outsourced the building of the project, the construction of the project. They've outsourced it. And so now you can see why the cost of the project is like the market price of the project for Delhi Metro. Are you convinced to come true? You have no problem with the change of label. Is this clear? Okay. Now what I'm saying is now what I want you to make, what I want to make you understand is how the framework applies equally to all the categories that I'm going to put under the framework. Okay. Under this uh, price versus value approach. Okay. So now we have agreed that in the NPV of the project, if you look at the RHS, you can think of the RHS as having two parts, the fair value of the project and the market price of the project. Is this clear so far? Okay. Everyone's in agreement. Yes. Okay. So now what are we doing here? Now let's see. Now let's, let me just explain the fair framework because we are approaching what we are describing now is this entire category. Remember this whole thing is two approaches. One is value agnostic and one is value versus price comparison. Okay. So in this value versus price comparison, I'm giving you an example that you're already familiar with, which is the NPV. And I'm saying that this is what the value versus price comparison analysis framework is. Calculate fair value. Okay. Um, compare fair value to market price. Okay. Okay. Market price is easy. You can just get this market price. Okay. In the worst case of the Delhi Metro example, you have to go through a little bit of a headache of taking tenders and evaluating the bids and all that. But eventually you can get to a market price is very easy. It's objective. Okay. All right. Then if um, market price 
less than fair value what should we do buy or sell if market price is less than fair value buy buy, buy. buy. okay <laughs> Okay, this should actually be 3.1 and 3.2, but we'll just ignore that to save myself the time. Okay, if market price is greater than fair value, sell. Okay, so this is a generalized framework. Okay, now we'll see why the NPV actually accurately fits into this framework. Okay, we'll confirm that for ourselves. Okay, so if M now if go back to the NPV equation, if market price is less than fair value, what is the market price here? C0 okay and uh, this is the fair value okay so if market price is less than fair value in the sense is essentially we just ignore the signs okay but essentially if this is the, uh, less than fair value the absolute uh, values of these two then what will happen NPV will be positive if market price is less than fair value NPV will be positive so then when NPV is positive in your NPV project analysis framework what would you do you would accept the project okay now can i say is it uh, is it acceptable for me to say that accepting the project is the same as buying the project yes sir. Yes, sir. right accepting means i am willing to spend the money to invest in the project which is the same thing as i go to the market and spend the money to buy the uh, to have to have another bananas or whatever okay i'm buying it okay accepting the project means i'm buying the project okay now if market price is greater than fair value what will happen here if the market price is greater than value, fair value NPV will be negative. negative if negative NPV what do you do do you accept the project you reject the project okay can I say that rejecting the project is the same as selling the project you can't actually short sell the project but effectively it is essentially like I mean obviously it's not a perfect comparison but you don't buy the project if NPV is negative you don't buy the project yes. you don't invest in the project okay so in a sense the opposite of buying is to sell you're not buying the project means you're passing up on this project you're essentially saying that because the NPV is negative I will not invest in the project which is if you could go short the project think about it if you could if projects were tradable okay they're not tradable but if you could go short the project why wouldn't you why wouldn't you sell the project think about it if NPV is negative means that the market price is higher than the fair value of the project yes sir. okay so if you could actually trade in project bids okay you would actually because if you this is obviously uh, difficult it won't happen in the real world but conceptually if you could do it you would sell the project means what if you sell the project suppose the market price of the project is 50 million dollars mm -hmm. and according to you the fair value of the project is only 30 million dollars mm -hmm. So if you sell the project, you will receive fifty million dollars. Yes, yes, twenty And you are selling the project, and you are uh, you have to pay up the returns of the project now. Okay, because you have sold the project, you have to pay up, deliver. So when you deliver the returns of the project, you are only delivering a, a, a present value of thirty million dollars, yes. but you are receiving fifty million dollars. Yes. So conceptually, you can see that if you could sell projects, if you could buy and sell projects, you would sell it. Mm -hmm. Because see, think about it this way: when Delhi Metro buys the Karnal project for fifty million dollars, who is selling the project? LNT is selling the project. The contractor is selling the project. Yes. Okay. So what will be his out when he sells the project? What are his inflows? The market price of the project. Let's say that Delhi Metro pays them up front, the whole amount. So then, when LNT look at it from LNT's point of view, LNT is selling the project, and Delhi Metro is buying the project. Okay, so LNT when they sell the project, their inflow is what? Fifty million dollars. Market price is fifty million dollars. Okay, and what are LNT's outflows? Everything it will cost to buy, build the project, and deliver it. That's thirty million dollars. Present value of the cost is thirty million. So they will make a twenty million profit on a PV basis. So Delhi Metro is buying it. LNT is selling it. Okay. So can you see that there is a comparison there? Yes. Okay, so you can see that it is accurate to fit the NPV into this framework. The broad framework is like this. Calculate fair value, compare it to market price. If market price is below fair value, you buy. If market price is above fair value, you sell. Okay, in some cases you may not be able to sell. 
okay uh, so now let's look at one more thing here value investing can you see again I'm just testing it out from different I'm just you know telling you the same thing from different angles so that it gets drilled into your head okay value investing is an important investment philosophy which you should be aware of okay can you see that value investing is the same thing as investing in positive NPV investments yes, yes. because what are you doing in value investing you calculate this is suppose now let's suppose this is the fair value of a stock this part here the CIs the fair value of a stock the PVs of the CIs are you following many people are tuning out I mean maybe I'm over some over repeating the same thing yes okay now we can go on good good if you are already clear then fine so value investing is the same as investing in net positive NPV projects okay so what you have to understand clearly here I'm just giving you a, a, a perspective on these things that there is no difference with all of these approaches you don't you've done bond valuation you've done bond valuation okay stock valuation Gordon growth model or if you discount earnings or if you discount uh, you know uh, you do uh, you've done enterprise value yes, in M&A yes. okay you're valuing the whole company okay same concept okay essentially these are all the same concepts and they are following into the same framework which is value versus price if you see how it's how it, how is it connected to the decision problem when you try to connect the NPV analysis or the bond valuation or the stock valuation etc to the decision problem of buy or sell that's when you see that this value versus price framework is applied you, when you go from valuation to the decision problem essentially how do you go there you go there applying the value versus price framework which is this again people are zoning out as if I'm talking Japanese or something are you following what I'm saying yes. you apply your valuation techniques and then when you go to solve the decision problem you're essentially applying this framework the price versus value comparison okay so now can you see that there is a philosophical difference between there's an important philosophical difference between the TA approach and all these FA approaches yes. can you see because in TA you are not concerned with value at all you don't really care what value is okay Whereas in this approach, you are always comparing comparing price to value. Is this clear? Color? Making sense? You're looking a bit zoned out. Not enough coffee in the morning. What happened? Are you following? Okay. Okay. All right. So, and I, I just wanted to give you this. I hope it's not confusing. It's meant to be not confusing because you need to know about these things. You need to know where where everything goes. Okay. Now. Now, typically, you notice that when later on, when you do courses on modeling and stuff like that now in the industry and all that, you'll find typically most of the time it tends to focus on this, or you end up doing balance sheet and all those kind of PNL forecasting and things like that. Okay, but there is another category of models. Okay, that's why I see within this category also, uh, within this value versus price, I've given two categories. Okay, one is called uh, AFV. AFV stands for. Uh, is it written here? That's not been written. That's not ha that hasn't been written here. A let's write it here and then write it here also. AFB is what? Do you remember this term? What is it? I've used it before. Okay. Now, in plain English, what this really means is. Uh, if I were to explain it using a longer sentence, arbitrage free valuation means any valuation which is done in a way that ensures that there are no arbitrage opportunities okay so here now you need to understand uh, something called uh, it, I think I'm not going to go into that maybe at this stage I'll come back to this framework a little bit later because I want to get into the option model but let's understand this as only one type of arbitrage uh, there's one type of valuation which is very different from forecast based valuation all these things I'm calling forecast based valuation stock valuation project valuation I'm calling it forecast based valuation why because what is the big forecast here guys what is the big forecast here present value of cash, the, cash in present value is not the forecast cash but the cash flows are the, cash the cash forecast flows. the pro project cash flow which is the long discussion that we had in the earlier part of the class which is that this is where the risk is the cash flows are all just forecasts so forecast has no I mean it's it's basically very uncertain okay there's no guarantee that it will come true okay so that's why I'm calling it you'll see that all these approaches they are all based on forecasts okay you're forecasting the dividends of the stock 
that may or may not turn out to be true you are forecasting the returns from the project that forecast may well turn out to be wrong are you following what i'm saying yes sir. yes Tushar, you're also falling asleep if you're not following then you should tell me what is the problem are you following why i'm calling these approaches all forecast based valuation no sir it's a <laughs> yeah so you were not paying attention it's just you understand this expression forecast based valuation okay so i'm applying that to all these all these approaches and why am i calling it forecast based valuation because the valuation is based on forecasts okay it is critically dependent on forecasts and which is here the most important forecast is these things the cash flows okay the cash flows of the project this is the crucial part of the exercise this is what goes where you have massive errors okay then and this is nothing but a forecast okay is this clear to everyone yes. so you have to be aware of this so that's why i'm calling these all, all these approaches forecast based valuation because all of them have the same property they are all based on crucially based on the forecasts of the project returns or the asset returns in general terms okay all right so that's why this category of valuation techniques both are both are value versus price both afv and fbv both are value versus price but there is an important difference between these kinds of approaches and these approaches because these are based on forecasts okay and afv i'm not going to go into right now okay but i'm just giving you the categorization okay i'm just giving you the how to understand this okay that uh, there's a category of valuation models called afv and typically you'll find most of your courses or industry courses will not address this part the afv valuation models okay some will uh, but uh, essentially these are what are these these are all these models pricing of FX forwards pricing of futures pricing of uh, FX cross rates okay this is just for your information at this stage I'll explain it to you later when we come back to this framework all option pricing models are also AFP models okay but there is a problem here this is AFP because the methodology that is used is the AFP methodology but it's actually not AFV. It's not actually arbitrage free. Okay. So that's why I'm calling it improperly so called. These are called AFP models, but they're actually not arbitrage free. Okay. So at this point, you just understand this. Obviously, you don't understand everything because I've not explained what is arbitrage and all that. Okay. But we don't have time to go into this. I'll come back to this later. Okay. But we are just making the categorization. You should be aware that there is also another category of models. Okay, that's why I'm giving you this uh, framework for perspective so that you know whatever you're doing, where does it sit in the larger scheme of things. So there's also a big category of models called AFP models, out of which again you have two subcategories. Some of these things which you should be aware of, like FX forwards, you know what FX forwards are. Pricing of FX for valuation of FX forwards, this is a classic case of arbitrage free valuation. Okay, this is really arbitrage free and it's a very different, so this is not really subjective. So these models are actually not subjective. The AFP properly so-called uh, is not subjective. Okay. All, let me just write this important point because as I said, I confirmed Vibhu's uh, uh, view that valuation is subjective and uh, price is objective. Okay. But there is an exception to that. Okay. But I'll just write that down. All valuation is subjective and price is objective okay there is one exception to that exception is um, is not subjective it's objective okay so this is the only exception okay these kinds of models these are actually objective because you can actually enforce the valuation you can make the price converge to the value okay to the fair value so we'll come to that later i think if we go into this it will become a very long discussion i want to progress a little bit more but are you guys very confused if i leave the afv discussion at this stage 
Will you be very confused? I mean, if we come back to this and I want to go on to the option uh, part of it, the pure option part yes, of it. You can give a brief. Is that okay? Yes, yes, okay. Right. At this point, it's like, is that at this point, I'm just showing you, okay, on the map, there are these two countries, Sweden and Denmark, located over here. But you don't know anything else about what is Sweden or what is Denmark. But you know where they are located on the map. That's all. Now, I'll come back later to have a discussion about those countries. Is this clear? Okay, That's what we are doing. So, you have a framework. A little, a little bit brief description of AFP. Okay, AFB, I'll just give you a very quick example of AFB, okay, Let, so that you have an understanding of AFB, okay. Let's say, Patna sugar price equal to, uh, I'm not writing rupees per kilo or something, let us just write 45, okay. Then, um, Delhi Okay, um, Delhi sugar price equal to, I'm giving ex extreme examples, okay, and okay, so this is all rupees per kilo. Okay, so let's say you have a situation where you have the sugar price in Patna, which is 45 rupees. The shipping cost per kilo is 20 rupees. Okay, and let's say you can ship instantly. Okay, and let's assume that these are both uh, above prices are bid and offer both. <coughs> There's a term in the markets which you should be aware of, choice prices. Choice prices means a choice price means um, you can either buy or sell at that same price. Normally, our bid is lower and the offer is higher. Okay, and so that is the normal uh, bid and offer price. So when a market maker quotes you, suppose you're asking for dollar Swiss and twenty. Okay, so instead of quoting seventeen twenty seven. He quotes uh, 18 choice. 18 choice means whatever the big figure is, okay. Uh, at that price, you can decide to either sell to him or you can buy from him. So that's called a choice price. This is a new lingo that you're learning, okay. So bid and offer you're already familiar with. Now there's a concept of some market maker quotes you a choice price. He doesn't quote you bid and offer separately, he's quoting you a choice price. If he's that means he'll quote you only one price and it's your choice. You can either sell to him, between bid and offer is the same. That's all it means, okay? Uh, you can sell. That is basically bid and offer. Bid is equal to offer. That's what it means, okay? That's all that it means. But it's new lingo that you should learn, okay? So let's assume that the above are choice prices, okay? Right. Now, if this is what pre uh, prevails in... Um, let's understand what is... First, let's understand what is uh, AFV. So at Kaba's request, we have gone into this discussion of uh, AFV. Okay, all right. Quiet, quiet, guys. Okay. So, um, so the question is, AFV price in Delhi. Okay. What is the AFV price in Delhi? Okay, so this, this will give you a flavor with a very crude and simple example. This will give you a philosophical flavor for what, I mean, a flavor for what the philosophy of arbitrage free valuation is. So the question we are asking in this particular little example is, what is the AFP price of sugar in Delhi? Okay, no restrictions on, uh, okay, here let's write one more thing. I'm going to have to collapse it because it's not fitting in one view. Okay. Okay, no restrictions on uh, the UP Delhi trade. Okay, so no restrictions on shipping across U UP Delhi borders and all that. Okay, no uh, no border restrictions on UP Delhi trade. Okay, then what is the AFV price in Delhi? 
Okay, is the question clear? Of course, other than the fact that you don't understand what AFB is, it has not been taught to you. But uh, you tell me, okay, tell me, Bola, what should be the fair price? Patna, buy or sell at 45 rupees, choice prices. Delhi, buy or sell at 75 rupees. Okay, cost is 20 rupees to transport. Okay, no other costs. Now, is there any opportunity for you to make some money? Yes. I'm asking Bola. What will you do? One minute. Be quiet. Give him the mic. Now, let's say if I want you to make some money out of, can you make some money out of this? What can you do? Sir, sell it at high price. Sell it at high price in Delhi. Yes, sir. You want to sell it at Delhi. Okay, so you get the Delhi dealer on the phone, left ear. You tell him that you have sold to him at 75. Now you have sold to him at 75. Now you have to deliver the sugar. If you sold him, let's say you sell him 10 kilos of sugar at 75. Sir, I will include that amount, the shipment cost in the my market. Board. No, no, that's okay. But I'm just coming to the first part of it. Uh, you have decided to sell to the Delhi dealer. You've sold him 10 kilos at 75. Okay. Now the problem is you have sold him 10 kilos. So fine, he'll pay you 10 kilos into 75. But you have to, he'll pay you rupees. But you have to deliver 10 kilos of sugar to him. Yes. Now where will you get the sugar? From Patna. From Patna. Okay. So that means you have to buy or sell in Patna. Sir, buy. You have to buy in Patna. So on the other year you have the Patna dealer. Yes. Okay. You have already contracted with him to buy. Yes. Then you have to get the shipper. Arrange the shipping from Patna. So let's say shipping is instantaneous. Okay. Let's assume. Okay. We have uh, what is that hyperloop between Delhi and Patna. <laughs> so you can get very quick shipping okay so now you will take the sugar which you bought in patna which has been which is now being shipped and you will deliver it to the dealer in delhi okay so you have bought from him so you have to pay him 45 rupees yes, then you have to pay 20 rupees to the shipper mm -hmm. so your outflows are 65 yes. and your inflow is 75 okay so you make a 10 rupees per kilo profit okay is this clear now this simple example gives you the flavor of all arbitrage free valuation is nothing but this okay in practice what might happen is instead of down here we have only three moving parts delhi price shipping cost and patna price but in more complex examples of arbitrage free valuation you might have like 11 moving parts but the philosophy doesn't change okay typically you will have a price which can be uh, compared to you know basically the 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 fair value here what are you doing actually okay let's understand why bola decided to sell in delhi okay why did he decide to sell in delhi okay so average for average free will come to this okay so why did he decide to sell in delhi let's understand this okay what is the process that he followed he okay All right. Okay. So what did he do? He calculated the first thing he did was, so the first thing that you have to do here when you're facing a situation like this for all kinds of uh, buy sell decision problems, which you are deciding to solve by this technique, by using this approach value versus price. Remember, you can also solve it using TA without any reference to value. Okay. But if you decided to solve it using value versus price, the first thing you should look at for any kind of situation is, can I apply AFV? Can I, is it possible for me to apply a AFV? Okay, and properly so called, that is, let's call it true AFV. Okay, uh, can I apply AFV? Is it possible to apply AFV? The first thing you should check. So, what Bola does is he checks this. What is the fair value? Can I calculate it using AFV? Okay, so what he does is here calculate the fair value. Now, if he, he sees that price in Delhi, the sugar in Delhi is the same as sugar bought. One is sugar in Delhi, you have the real sugar in Delhi in the market in Delhi, but the synthetic equivalent of that, you think about an equivalent. Okay, you can you visualize a synthetic equivalent. You understand what a synthetic equivalent is? Yes, sir. A kind of like an artificial equivalent, which has the same effect, but it is not quite the same thing which you see. So synthetic equivalent of price in Delhi is okay, let's call this let's call this here, let's bring this here. Okay, AFV means here you compare it to 
Um, uh, is there a synthetic equivalent price for Delhi sugar? Okay. Is there a synthetic equivalent price for Delhi sugar? The answer is yes. And that is what? That is sugar bought in Patna, which has been transported, bought in Patna, but transported from Del Patna to Delhi. If you are able to do that, is this the same as sugar bought in Delhi? Yes, sir. This is clear? Everyone follows? Yes. So that's what I'm calling a synthetic equivalent. Okay. So it is not originally sugar that was maybe grown in the, the neighboring fields and brought to the uh, market in Delhi. But it is actually equivalent because you bought it in Patna and you had it shipped over for it's the same quality of sugar. So it is a synthetic equivalent of sugar in Delhi in this context. Is this clear? Are you yes. following? Yes. Money, you're following? Okay. All right. So is there a synthetic equivalent price for Delhi sugar? Okay. That price is the um, AFV. One minute. That price is the AFV of Delhi sugar. AFV is arbitrage free value. Okay, so that is that that price is the uh, fair value using AFV of make sure you understand the st statement. Okay, who was the person saying done sir done? Who? Just breathe. Okay, one minute. Let's complete this one part, okay? This last part, okay? So, uh, calculate fair value. So, is so you find first you ask, is there a synthetic equivalent, okay, for Delhi sugar? And that price, the synthetic equivalent price, will be the fair value using AFP. Make sure you understand why I'm writing the language like this. Make sure you understand these are all new concepts. So, first you find you understand the concept of synthetic equivalent. You try to observe the situation and see if there is a synthetic equivalent for Delhi sugar and what if it exists, okay, the price of that synthetic equivalent, here the synthetic equivalent is buy in Patna, ship it over to Delhi. Yes. So it's not just 45, but 45 plus 20, okay, to make it equivalent, you have to ship it over. So the price of the synthetic equivalent is the fair value using AFV of Delhi sugar, okay. Now what will happen, when will last part, when will AFV break down? If I change this from no border restrictions, so if I put up checkpoints in Delhi, no trade between Delhi and UP and assuming you can't get down, get out, come through uh, maybe Madhya Pradesh, uh, maybe uh, come through like uh, other states or something. So only way to get to Delhi is from, through the Delhi Patna uh, Bihar border, okay, uh, Delhi uh, through UP and on Bihar and all that, okay. So if I put border restrictions, then is there a synthetic equivalent? Yes, sir. No, no, no. You can't ship it. Let's say I put a restriction saying this is not well, well, well written that I'm imagining that Bihar and Delhi are adjoining. Okay. But the point is, uh, well, this is actually Bihar, Bihar is not in UP. But uh, so let's just assume that Bihar is in UP. Okay. Now, okay, guys, now is this clear? Now understand this last point and I'll let you go. Okay. That if I set up border restrictions, if I don't allow you to ship, then it is no longer you, it's not an equivalent you can't arbitrage the price because you can't buy sugar from Patna and ship it to Delhi if I put up restrictions so we'll discuss this in the next class I have taken only how much time okay two minutes, two minutes. that's not much okay